this phone, all right, get this show and all our shows on your smartphone or Blackberry via Stitcher. Just go to our website, autoline.tv, look for the Stitcher little box thing, click that on, it'll walk you through the paces. Put in the promo code AutoLine, you might win a hundred bucks. And we're going to get started here in just a minute. Ben, when do we want to do the trivia thing? You can do it right off the top if you want. To okay, well. We'll do that. Have them send you your mail at autolinedetroit.tv. Okay. Okay. Cool. Outer Line After Hours is brought to you by, <laughs> we should do my voice. We need David Welch in here to do the Scottish announcer <laughs> bit. Right. So Boddington, eh? Boddington, ale. Quite refreshing. Right, here we go, guys. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion, and by Chevrolet, Chevy runs deep. Hey, thanks for joining us, folks. Auto Line After Hours, I've got my, my buddy here. John? Peter. How you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing fabulously. Fabulously. And we've also got Chris Pruce joining us on this show, too. And I think he's with Ford or something like that these days. I'm not sure anymore. He's in the solar system of the automobile industry. <laughs> that's, that's where I intend to stay. <laughs> he was formerly at one time at General Motors. Yeah, we'll get into the, some of that later. But you're, you're what, Team Detroit right now, right, Basically, Chris? Basically, you can call me Team Detroit. I work. And that's part of WPP? WPP. Hill and Knowlton? Hill and Knowlton is the agency, but we're all one happy team for Ford. So we basically just keep telling the Ford story in more in creative ways. And that's what I'm all about. Cool. Well, we'll get into some of the, all this stuff. But Peter, you've got a contest you want to run. Yes, I do. <laughs> this beautiful black swatch, sports watch, with Degla lime green, uh, pointers and stuff is going to be available to the first AutoLine After Hours viewer who can answer the following. I'm adding, I'm making it a two-part question. A two-parter. Uh -oh. Okay, and, and Ben, we send this their, their responses to viewer mail, right? Yes. So Peter's going to ask a trivia question. You got to answer it. Whoever gets the first right answer to us tonight gets this marvelous Swatch Sport Watch. It's, it's excellent. And, and so you got to send the email to viewermail at autolinedetroit.tv. Okay, part one of the question. What was the name I used on Auto Extremist when I first uh, appeared on the internet on June 1st, 1999? Part two. Do you, do you, do you have to answer in the form of a question? Like <laughs> no. <Saturday? laughs> No. Okay. Because that would be too hard. Just get for the some right of answer. Our viewers are a little. <laughs> I know. Challenged. Yes. Uh, part two of the question is who finished fourth overall in the 1971 Daytona 24 hour? You got to have all three drivers correct and what they were driving in. That's it. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> start start Googling. Yes. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> well, this will be interesting to see who comes in. Speaking of the 24 hours of Daytona, did you watch the race this last weekend? Uh, you know, I absolutely uh, was there and... Oh, you were there? <laughs> well, you know. Well, no, there I mean, in spirit. You know, yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Incognito. Yeah. Uh, incognito. Uh, this was going to be the one where uh, GM with their... Corvette prototypes were going to stomp on the competition. Oh, wait, I got to stop you right there. Why the the in the air quotation well, marks? Well, around because Corvette? you know GM. Uh, well, I think their hearts were in the right place. They wanted the Grand Am DPS to look better because they don't look that good. They look dumpy. Yeah, and so, the new ones look good. Yeah, so they wanted to do swoopier body works and uh, body work, and then you know they decided they were going to call them Corvettes. Well, you know, which is kind of a slap of the face <clears throat> of their factory Corvette racing team, but that's another uh, column. Uh, so they did this swoopy body work. They actually worked closely with Grand Am to reconfigure the rules for 2012, like for 18 months worth. They tweaked these bodies and worked with Grand Am closely. 
So, you know, a lot of people thought it was a fait accompli that they were going to win the race. Just stop. Was, the was Obama involved in all that no. sort of government motors retooling? <laughs> no, the, fortunately. That, I mean, I have no knowledge of that from my no. GM days. Yeah. Fortunately sure. not. But, no. you know, that's why they run the races and that's why they play the games. Because, you know, you don't win in the computer. You don't win in the boardroom. You don't win on paper. You got to run the race. And the GM effort blew up. And Ford Power Cars finished one, two, three. Wow. And it was a, it was a hell of a race. I mean, at like hour 22, the these guys are banging banging into each other. You know, still hours to go, and it was just astonishing to me that you can race that long, and cars are still nose to tail. Well, you know, uh, many years ago, these endurance races stopped being endurance races, and now they're just basically sprint races. They go as the cars don't break anymore, yeah, they or they go, rarely break. They I shouldn't as, say they never. Yeah, well, you know, GM's cars blew <laughs> they up, blowed up real blowed good. Blowed up real good. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, but it's a sprint race. And A.J. Allmendinger, who's a sterling road racer uh, anyway. And a pretty good NASCAR racer these yeah, days, and, too. And Oval racing. And Penske event. just hired him. Right. So uh, he, he drove a tremendous. Sounds like he had like a hamburger named after him, doesn't it? Didn't, didn't Daly's have like the humdinger or something, like the ham sandwich that was really yeah, great down know. the road or his something? Nickname. You know, you could be right because his nickname is Dinger. Right. Dinger yeah. But uh, he drove a great last stint, last two hours. That he, and, uh, it was awesome racing. Yeah. That, that, that's all I can say. So, so there you go, folks. That's, that was just to buy you time mm -hmm. to look up who came in fourth place overall. In the 1971. Daytona, Daytona 24 hours. Yes. Yeah. And you have to have all three drivers and what they were in. And then what was my name when I uh, launched Auto Extremist? The, the name I had on the website. And I'll explain the significance of that name if you care later. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I got to get that myself. So other big thing in the news this week is these rip-off Chinese designs, man. It's just unreal. Uh, you know, we ran on daily, this picture of the, the JAC Jinghuai Automobile Company. I think it's like the, the 4R3 or some nonsense, but it's a total ripoff of the F-150. E, no, it's the E149. The as E149. Oppo as opposed to the F-150. Ah. Oh, yeah, right. For the more cerebral out there got that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they basically, bought, me they basically bought an F-150, shipped it over there and copied it. Oh, the, why buy it? I'm sure they just drew it off pictures. And then somebody from Australia sent us a picture. They have another truck that is an absolute ripoff of the Chevy Colorado. Just unreal. I mean, I wouldn't doubt they didn't have to buy or do anything. They probably hacked into GM's computers or Ford's computers and download all the math data from the from the yeah. servers and probably just plugged it into their. That's something I don't care to think about. <laughs> yeah. So I don't even think they went to that trouble. I think they just took pictures. Blew them up, did tape drawings, and started well, you can doing see engineering. The court, too, when they look at this, they'll take a look of an F-150 next to this car. They'll take a look. I remember when Cherry Automotive had ripped off the Chevy Spark. The, Chevy Spark, Our, yeah. the GM lawyers actually took a you know a door aperture is the toughest fit on the car. Like the doors are have to be exact. They take a door off of a spark, put it on the Cherry, screw it in, and it shuts airtight. <laughs> Perfect seams. The judge looks at it. Says, I don't see it, you know. <laughs> <It's right>. like, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, the Chinese courts have essentially ruled unless you have an exact copy of everything, every nut, bolt, it, it's not a copy. Yeah. Clearly it's not a copy unless it's a copy. Yeah. So you're in trouble, man, if well, uh, they start copying you there. There's nothing much you can do about well, they've it. They've actually copied the whole state of Arizona in one part of China, and that's what people haven't figured out. Yet. So <laughs> you can actually go to Sedona <laughs> in the middle of the uh, Guangzhou province. Uh, cool. Uh, powerful. <laughs> But yeah, I thought that was pretty wild. And uh, and then we saw January sales, and pretty good. Yeah, the mm -hmm. most, the most. Uh, I mean, there were some high line, a uh, lot of media coverage for Chrysler and <clears throat> Hyundai, but I thought the most interesting thing was Toyota and Honda starting to show life. Yeah, they didn't do all that well. No, but they're starting they lost market share. Yeah, but they're coming. I agree with Peter. They're, they'll, they're they'll starting come to back. come back, and right. I think. You know, Chrysler's enjoying what Ford was was living in 09 and what GM got to live in 010. They're just, you know, the year over comps were just so horrible that, mm. that now all of a sudden, 
it looks great, and they'll get reality next year when they got to start meeting numbers like GM did in January. But how about my pal Sergio, Chris? Why don't you let's why don't you tell the audience what my pal Sergio was up to this? So week? yeah, we were talking about Tom Walsh in the Free Press this morning. You know, writes write the column, and at the end it was Sergio Marchionne opining on the unfairness of the government support of Ford and General Motors. <laughs> this is a guy who was gifted the Chrysler <laughs> yeah. Corporation by the U.S. They government. They got loans at Ford from the DOE, and our loan. Our loan guarantees are held up in paperwork. It was Sergio that gave you the whole company for free. What do you want, man? You were just there with your hand out. How dare they not give you another six billion to run it with? Oh, those unfair American congressmen. <laughs> That's just wild. Man. Amazing. That's our Sergio. Yeah. <laughs> But still, you know, I, I was surprised going back to the sales for, for a moment that Honda and Toyota didn't do better. I mean, now, Toyota did get best-selling car again with the Camry. They sold pretty good numbers. Uh, yeah, but Civic, I, I thought they were going to do better. Civic a pretty good month, too. Civic, Civic did, but Accord did not. Right. Accord was uh, pretty weak. Yeah. But I thought this was the time where they had all the inventory and they were going to come roaring back. Maybe I'm just impatient and it will happen. But I was surprised they didn't do better. Well, yeah, but their dealers, their dealer body is so strong that, you know, once they get cranked up again. Well, they're spending, yeah. Honda's in particular, and Toyota, they're both spending lavishly right now, uh -huh. advertising wise. I mean, they really are. And they've got the, the deals gas. going. Yeah, they too. got deals. You know, I think there was that graphic in the Fusion launch at the auto show where what they're spending in the mid segment now that average incentives are up something like, you know, almost 200% in some cases from average. So they're going to get back in there one way or the other. Yeah, I'll bet you the I'll bet you Honda. This is just a guess of mine. Doesn't quite get back to where it was before. That's my guess. And the only reason I say that is they've had, as we've talked about on the show a number of times, a string of products over the last number of years. This isn't a flash in the pan thing. A number of years, products that just fell flat on their face. Technically, they're behind the game right now. That's not something that you fix this fall. That's going to well, take years to and fix. And I'll say also, and I never thought it happened in my lifetime or career, you're finally now seeing that when you look at just consideration in the marketplace, the uh, stigma of the American nameplate, while slightly still there in some geographic areas, by and large has been neutralized heavily. Toyota's problems and the return of the auto industry and, uh, and just frankly a whole set of buyers that we didn't piss off back in the 80s and 90s uh, you know <laughs> who didn't buy who your did, products who back didn't know then. any better are coming into the marketplace now and I think it's a much more level playing field which means everything's getting much more hyper competitive and there aren't you know nobody's gliding anymore I've never seen it this cutthroat uh, at a marketing level at a you know just everybody's as sharp as they can be and it's it's reflected in the numbers uh -huh. yeah. The other ones that really, uh, I got to wonder how long they're going to be able to survive in the American market. Mitsubishi and Suzuki. Yeah. I mean, their, their numbers are. But, but Mitsubishi's are, been, you know, hanging by a thread for what, 20 years? Yeah. You know, they just, they'll like, they'll just trickle out enough cars. And it's amazing that they keep spending on this market like they do. I think they can afford it because of their strengths back in Japan. I don't think they can. I, I've heard that the Japanese government gives them like massive. Some sort, I don't know if it's incentives, I don't know if it's write offs, oh, but some trade. sort of support. It's free, it's free trade. It's free trade. <laughs> it's free trade. That's what it is. <laughs> right. Honey, it's free trade. But here's the difference why I think it's going to change this time, and that's the, where the yen is. There's Mitsubishi and They're Suzuki are still importing most of the vehicles they sell here. And those, I mean, and the yen just keeps going up and up and up. It's, yeah, it's keep, that's going to really. So I can see the whole two of them maybe not going to be able to make it in this market. But it's not as if it's going to clear the decks for everybody else because no. last month they sold a combined 6,000 units, Mitsubishi and Suzuki, in the U.S. market. That's and amazing. That's, so even if they go away, it's not like everyone's going to have this feeding frenzy. You're, you're going to no. have a feeding frenzy over 6,000 cars a month, which is not a very big number. Yeah, that's for and sure. uh, BMW fell back behind Mercedes. You know, BMW won the crown in 2011. But, you know, luxury, premium, and I want to be the guy. I mean, is there something inherently wrong with a sales race amongst these guys? Ford. Is they going to kill their own cheese? Yeah, GM and Ford invented it. 
So, yeah, yeah, but they did. But here's the difference. These guys are doing it in the luxury segment. That's what I mean. So and if that's if, if, crazy. If, 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 uh, if, you know, if I'm, you know, what, what value is the brand when some schmuck down the street is making 50 grand a year can drive the same car I can because of a 399 lease deal? I mean, is that, you know, no offense to 50 grand a year people. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, well, yeah, it's, it's not a good thing. Uh, and BMW were blowing out cars like big time in December, so they just decided. Oh, I think Mercedes blew out a whole lot more well, than BMW did. Yeah, but did. Mercedes did too, but you can tell that the BMW home office said, okay, we're taking a break in January. And uh, so they should just stop doing whatever they're doing. Notice Audi doesn't say anything. Doesn't need to. Don't need it doesn't to. need to get into this kind of yeah. war. It just needs to keep its nose down. And they're making push the premiumness making, of the brand. I bet you they're making more money per vehicle than BMW. Oh well, I would I would hope so. I mean, they're much more integrated and using much more shared architecture and shared componentry with the mother brand uh, of VW. So they should be. Yeah, and speaking of VW, man, they had a phenomenal month. Yeah, they're adding phenomenal. They're months. adding production to the Passat too. It's selling very well. Yeah. I mean, you know, we in the media criticized it. Oh, it's not German enough. It's not Volkswagen enough. Well, we forgot to talk to the people who buy cars because they love this thing. Well, I still don't really like it all that much. I think if you order it right, it's what a Volkswagen should be. Mm -hmm. But the standard car, I don't know. It's so I'll bet you they don't sell many of the standard cars. Yeah, I hope not. Boy, those are well, their transaction price isn't too far off where it was before. Now, one of the reasons is, even though they had a high sticker price before, they discounted like crazy. Yeah, they are they don't have a great story on incentives, I think, by and large, over the last uh, several years. And I Meaning that they, they had too many of them. They had too many of them. I mean, it's pretty easy to get your hands on one, so... But that's what the price, it's all about carrying price now, too. I mean, I think the days uh, of, of buying your market share for, most, for the most part has gone. Yeah. The other thing I noticed is uh, everybody criticized the Volt because sales were down. <clears throat> and, and they were, and they were down a lot month over month. But so was the Nissan Leaf. In fact, while everybody's, you know, jumping on the Volt for not selling all that well, oh. Nissan sold 76 Maybe I think it was seventy three yeah. more Leafs than uh, you know, Chevy sold Volts. In my hiatus from my uh, um, exit from the former company, uh, I was doing a lot of consulting work, and I, I did did some stuff for the Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers. We, they wanted to delve into this issue about advanced technology cars getting geared up for a possible cafe debate. So I ran a lot of numbers. If you look at the aggregate rate of sale for advanced technology cars, and, and Wards has been tracking this since about '05. It started out with about two or three nameplates, and really it was just the Prius and a few other knockoffs. If you look at the total volume, not the, the rate or the share, yeah, yeah. the terminal volume has moved from like, it would started out at about maybe a 10 to 14,000 a month clip and swelled in the best of days to maybe 30, 32,000 a month clip. The number of nameplates went from like four to 14. But if you look at it, if the market goes up, it stays stable. If the market goes down, it only goes down a little bit. If gas prices spike, they go up a little bit. If gas price goes down, they go down. What it tells you is nobody's buying these cars for their economic relevance. They're buying them for the same reason they buy a Corvette they, or they buy a, a Porsche. It's a lifestyle statement. There's only a handful of people who want to pay that money to get that lifestyle statement. And the market is hyper rational. It's a fact. Right. So there, it has nothing to do with the Volt, the marketing, the government. It's just there's only so many people that are signing up for a car that's packed full of batteries for 40000 bucks. That's right. the way it is. Well, look, I, I did an interview uh, last week with Margot Oge, who's like one of the top people at the EPA. In fact, she's in charge of anything to do with transportation. She's in charge of it at the EPA. She told me in tw tw 2025, 90% of all the cars and trucks on the road are gonna be gasoline or diesel engines. And her forecast for electrics, 1%. 1% in, two th in 2025. Look at, look, and I've had the benefit of being in one company and moving to another company and seeing all the, all the sausage. And I'll tell you what, the exact same numbers with the exact same viewpoint and the exact same conviction, it's the same story. And I'm sure if you went into anybody else's shop, the fact of the matter is we are still a very 
cost-conscious market. It's still the biggest purchase people make, and nobody rolls the dice on something that expensive. And, and I would add this, too, Chris. Where else in the world are they selling? They're not. They're not. They're, they're not, not selling in Europe. They're not hey, in Japan. Somebody, they're selling a little bit okay because the government's got big incentives on hybrids right now. Hey, if we were all driving battery cars today, best lithium ion, and some joker came up with this magic vial of liquid and <laughs> smelled really funky and said, "This is called gasoline," and you will not believe the amount of BTU energy for cubic inch of space this thing does. Watch what it does, and poof, and he blows it up, and it only costs this much. We think it was a. It would be the greatest scientific breakthrough known to man. There's a reason. Battery electric vehicles didn't exist, uh, didn't make it past the, uh, the, the starting gate. It, it's just a fact. It's physics. That's right. You can't cheat economics. You right. can't cheat physics. Well, you know, I, I talked with uh, Roland Huang, too, from uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council, hardcore environmentalist. I like the guy a lot. I actually like talking <laughs> with him a lot. He thinks electrics are only going to be 3% of the market in 2025. Now, this is a guy who really thinks we should do Alexa, electrics, so pro-electric, thinks the government should dump up, and he only sees it going to 3%. Yeah, well, that's apparently, why <laughs> apparently nobody uh, has contacted from the outside world the California Air Resources Board. Yeah, they want to amp just, it up to 15%. <laughs> it's, just, it's just insane. When, when did they have their first EV mandate? Wasn't it like 1991? Well, they you. just came out with 2025. They just came out with Oh, I know, no. But I'm saying if you go back, I think it's back to 1991. It goes back. The fight The fight began in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, to, to date you, I've, this is the 24th anniversary of my career. One of the first things I worked on uh, at Chrysler Corporation when I joined them oh, 18 years ago was fighting the ZEV mandate in California. So, yeah, it was like 1991. We managed to punt delays and, you know, threaten referendums. We don't, I don't think you had a substantive application. They went to LEV, then they went to ULEV instead. Then they went to SULEV. SULEV. Uh, SULEVs. And then, <laughs> and, eventually, and then eventually you got a ZEV mandate. But CARB's philosophy is, you know, you will just keep pushing out there. If they want to go an inch, they're going to throw the gauntlet out there a mile. And... You know, and, and honestly, it's a good process. I mean, regulations in this country, by definition, is, is a, a process of tension. It gets crazy when all the factions start warring, but I would argue that, you know, society's been fairly well served, although, you know, there's been some, some bad bad outcomes. Served in what way? In a, in a, in a due process? Because no, the end result hasn't really accomplished no, but anything. I would say it in as much that the, the, uh, the, the honest truth is I think CAFE did more to crash the price of fuel. They would have been better off without CAFE and just letting a natural flow. Of eventually, <laughs> gas would have become you know, constrained based on the fact we were just sucking down too much of it. Price controls would have come in and we would have reacted to the market. Instead, CAFE put a big artificial you know, uh, uh, crush on demand and we ended up basically having gas for a buck and everybody bought SUVs and they're surprised that was the outcome. So that's what I mean by the regulations yeah. don't always come out right. Yeah. Hey, why don't we take our uh, first break right now. Ben, let's uh, give a shout out to our friends at Bridgestone. So I see Peter looking at that Swatch Sport Watch. We got anything, Ben? Not yet. <laughs> Okay, go through it again. Uh, what are the two questions? Okay, yeah, we'll send you this watch if you get these two questions. One, what was the name I used on the website when I started on June 1st, 1999? It wasn't my name, actual. And two, who finished fourth overall at the Daytona 24-hour in 1971? You need to name the three drivers and what they were driving. ba dum bum ba dum dum Oh, yeah, yes. say that again. Viewer mail at autolinedetroit.tv. So, Chris, you're, you're working with Ford right now. I'm sure now it's, what, been over a year since you left General Motors. Year. You, you must have some perspective on sure what the company went through. It was an amazing journey, there's no doubt. I mean, looking back, it feels like a lifetime ago. But, yeah, it was, it was uh, seeing the going through the bankruptcy and, and uh, going through three CEOs uh, effectively after Rick left in a matter of eight months, um, watching the transformation of the, of the internal culture and then the radical changes that came on you know, late in the game with uh, the last big uh, 
turn of the leadership, which uh, eventually spit me out the end of the wedge o -matic. Um, So it was Ed Whitaker, <laughs> after Rick was fired, it was... Fritz. Was Fritz or Ed yeah. Whitaker? Fritz uh, and then Ed. Fritz, <laughs> uh, Wagner got fired, then Fritz got fired, yeah. then... Then Ed. Then Ed then quit. Then Ed quit. Then Ed quit. And now Ackerson's yeah, got it. Yeah, and now Ackerson's got it. So, yeah, I mean, it was, it was an unbelievable time. I'm thrilled to see, you know, the company doing so well. And, uh, but again, I think, you know, selfishly, I'd still say most of the, the success they're enjoying is at the hands of the, the previous regime's product acumen and a pretty thorough scrubbing from the government, you know, 90 billion bucks off your books, a $50 billion check to go run the company and the other guys' products. You know, it's pretty that good. That helps a lot. That helps. So just, just ask Sergio. Yeah. So I mean, he's all the success Chrysler has in the trenches right now are for vehicles that were in the works before he got there. Yeah. So so they'll they'll go. I mean, some hugely talented people still there. Great products. A lot of passion. Great brands. Um, and GM's doing a lot of stuff right still. I mean, they they are. And uh, you know, personally, I, I uh, as speaking from a competitive standpoint right now, being more aligned to the... Now you want to put a boot in their face. Yeah, well, Dan says we're at war, so, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all warfare now. Um, but I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't uh, wish the people ill. But, yeah, we want to put them out of business if we can. <laughs> <laughs> but in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> but in a good way. In a good happy yeah, way. We, yes, we want to put them down nice and <laughs> nice quiet-like. Quiet. Yeah. <laughs> right. But it's great. Ford's great for me because I, I grew up a Ford kid. And Peter and I, that's the one connection we had. We both grew up the, the, uh, the kids of, of uh, well-known PR guys. My dad, not nearly of the, of the lore of, of uh, Peter's dad, but uh, being second generation Ford, that, that had a lot to do with wanting to go back there against other opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really enjoying it. So, yeah, you guys know Ford really well. I'm wondering if, you know, the easy stuff is over at the company right now. I got a sense that, boy, maybe it's going to be tougher for them. You know, they, they got caught completely off guard by the My Ford Touch thing. Uh, the transmission issues with the, the dry clutch DCT in the Fiesta, that boom, you know, they, they didn't see that one coming, too. And don't get me wrong, I'm still very bullish on Ford. I think better days are ahead but I think the easy part of it's over with now. Well, I think the easy part is definitely over. Uh, you know, I think they showed well in Detroit. Um, uh, I think they should have not shown the Lincoln MKZ in Detroit because it was clearly the fusion show. And now they're going to show the production version of the MKZ in New York. Which means it'll have door handles on it. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> That's know, about the only difference. But the one thing Ford does have is their product cadence is going to be strong. It is strong. But, but it's just, you know, yeah, it's a lot tougher because it's not the scrappy company that Alan Mulally took by the lapels and said, you know, we're, gonna, we're doing this and we're going forward. Now people say, well, you know, Ford's, you know, Ford's there. I mean, they are very strong, competitive. Now it gets harder because they're not the scrappy company on their way up. They're very established, very competitive. And everyone's gunning for them. Yeah, and everyone's gunning for them. So yeah, it gets harder, but uh, if you look at their product cadence going out the next 24, 36 months, they've got a lot well, of that, stuff. That was, that was the best surprise coming in there from the outside. Yeah. I mean, um, and again, having, having gotten to see the next five, six years from both companies and uh, coming into Ford, you know, I would, I would, I would agree. It's a lot harder, and I think they, they know that in spades. Um, I would say the leadership culture in that company and the focus that in that in that company is remarkable. Um, anybody who's been around autos knows this is a business of momentum and order. And they have the big mo. <laughs> and well, keeping momentum and that pulls all the way through to the dealers. But this is not an industry that has dealt with growth. None of the, we have been in decline for 20 some years. We've managed our way down, and that is the we meaning the, the Detroit three. Yeah, and the that's Detroit a, three, not right. the whole industry. So just like the Detroit Lions, changing a culture of losing into a culture of winning, and then maintaining that culture is the trick. And I think Ford has easily made that transition. I've never met anybody like Alan Mulally. I thought Bob Lutz. I was Bob Lutz's bag man, if you will, PR guy, handler for years. I thought Bob was the gold standard of, of media aplomb until I went to an interview with Alan Mulally and was just absolutely <laughs> He's bored. different. He's not just different, he's genuine. I mean, you want to think it's an act. But I, I got to tell you, when I got hired as an agency guy, 
Uh, and the first call I got, the first call I got, I'm sitting with the last day before I leave consulting to, to, go into the, to go into the car company. I'm in a movie theater with my kids. I see my Blackberry light up and I see it's Dearborn. I think, oh, it must be the client. I better go answer. And I get it, and it's, uh, hey, Chris, it's Alan Mulally welcoming you here. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, yeah. uh, and, and again, juxtaposing to the company I left yeah, in the right. leadership style there, which maybe wasn't quite as, as, uh, as engaging. And, uh, you know, I, I call my Ray Day, who, you know, my client. Who hired, I said, Ray, it was a great touch to have Alan do it. He's like, I didn't have Alan do that. I didn't even know he called you. Yeah. But, <laughs> right. You know, of course. Yeah. That's, and that that's means, Mulally, right? That's Mulally, but that's a difference. That permeates your leadership, changes your culture. There there is tremendous focus there, but I, I, I agree with Peter. I mean, it's, it, it's not peaches and cream. They know they're up against it. They're being gunned for, but I got to tell you, they're a talented crew. They're talented, and in North America, I think they're going to do just fine. The worries I have for them right now are Europe, which is everybody's worry. Everybody's yeah. worry. But serious. South America, too. I was really shocked to see that Ford lost money in Latin America and, uh, and Asia. And that's when you go, whoa, doggy, you know, them's the emerging markets. What's going on there? Yeah. I, you know, it's going to be rocky roads. This Europe thing is everyone's sweating, and it's, it's bad. And uh, whether you're not positioned product-wise, I mean, it doesn't matter. This is an economic situation in Europe that's reaching crisis proportions, and you can tell some of the leaders at Ford are really concerned, and, and they should be, because this is bad. Well, you know, Ford's one of the few that really did some amount of restructuring in Europe. Uh, Dagenham, the big plant in England was closed. I know that they've reduced workforce and the like there, and I don't know for a fact, but my I would hazard to guess that Ford's probably done more restructuring than anybody else in Europe. And when they can't make money there after that, yowza. And then, you know, GM with Opal, that's a whole nother. Oh, they haven't even gotten going yet. Well, it's, you know, we're trying to fix it. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about that before and having, you know, being, an Op being at Opal before I came back and after the bankruptcy to lead communications here, um, Opal is sitting with more than double the plants than Ford is with essentially the same market share in, in production. And so when you look at that, if Ford's losing money on a restructured business with half the plants, can you imagine what Steve Gursky's facing at Opal right now? Right. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're looking at Mount Olympus here and you're, you're barefoot. I mean, it's, you got a long climb and it ain't going right. to be easy. And what I keep saying is it, it's not even a, a business problem that Opal faces in, in terms of trying to turn it around. It's the political minefield of German politics. European, but German especially. You, I did, again, you just went to school. When we were fighting the fight for Opel and it became Deutschland versus the US and it was the government of Merkel versus the emerging Obama government, we had Russians involved. I mean, this was high stakes. In fact, John Smith, who was running the deal for GM, is a good friend. He's going to write the book. He said it's going to be called Nopal. <laughs> you know, the sale of Opel, <laughs> Nopal. And, uh, but that was, that was an amazing journey, and uh, you're right. When, and we talked before, it's not just that they have this massive restructuring against all the social uh, challenges and the legal challenges and the labor strength. You've basically got the entire balance of the industry rooting for their demise because that will solve overcapacity to a large degree. So all of their political might, labor unions included, are all throwing rocks on the pile of opal to try to topple it over. It's a big, big, big thing to solve. I, I heard a fascinating conspiracy theory this week where you uh, what's reincorporate Opal with SAIC in China. Ah. So it's no longer a German, it's no longer a GmbH, German company. Well, right. Yeah, that's right. And now you get rid of the supervisory board, you get rid of all those labor guys that go along with it. Well, they so wanted to make it an AGE, so they never made it to AGE status, then I guess, that they stayed a, a GmbH. I, I think it's that was a part, GmbH. Yeah. I, I don't know that. But he's in a GM, GmbH, I think is how they say it. Okay. Uh, it, it. In either case, you're right, the supervisory board gives the labor bench pretty much 50% 50, 50 power on that. And now GM, interestingly, has sent a, a contingent of Americans over and tried to stack the supervisory board. Tim Lee's over there, Mary Barra's over there, Steve Gursky's taken over, uh, Straka being a, a CEO German, but obviously, you know, an implant from the, uh, from the uh, home team. It's quite an interesting drama developing. 
on that board. But I will tell you, this is not the first, not the second, not the third, but this is literally the fourth such intervention, going back to Jack Smith in the mid-'80s, to try to restructure Opal. And every, None of them work. every American that's gone over there has gone into the meat grinder and come Pretty back broken and their come, career. Yeah, and come back as hamburger. Go right. talk to Lou Hughes. And and you know, nobody's been able to solve it. Which is why I believe my former boss, Mr. Henderson, just wanted to sell it. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, was obviously reversed on that decision. By the way, the first second big decision of the new board of directors, the first one to fire Fritz and then the second one to keep Opal. We'll see how those pan out for them uh, uh, in the long run. We'll see. I mean, this has got to be the make or break year, though. I don't I, man. Either you fix it this year or it's never going to get fixed. And. I don't know. I, that's why I, I put some credence in this SAIC conspiracy theory. It, it, the it kind of makes sense. The Chinese could play. I mean, they, their, their insistence that their ability to export is the only way you can save Opal. But how do you, if you're SAIC, and maybe this, uh -huh. the, the radical growth of the Chinese market and the indifference to brands means you could put a, an, not, Opal, in, no. an I, Opal next to a Buick in, in the same market where Buick's the dominant brand and expect to sell the Opal at a premium. I don't think so. I think brands matter a lot in China. Well, that's what I mean. I say the, the, the blind, the blind statement of the two doesn't doesn't make any sense right so, right no yeah. it doesn't it doesn't so we shall see we wait take another commercial break um we wait? yeah let's let's do that hey uh, ben let, let's give a good shout out to our friends at chevrolet it was more than a car to him it really was his baby oh no that's my old Chevy. Dear God. Somebody gets so, well, we're a little bit early for a roundabout. Yeah, let's not. Or not roundabout, rapid but rapid fire. Roundabout we'll talk about later. Uh, let's see. Must see TV. Okay, the Super Bowl's coming up. And um, we should sit pitch next week's show because we'll have Gene Halliday in here talking yeah. all about the Super Bowl yeah, we'll car the, ads that ran. Do the download. I Even mean, though you wrote your column this week on all the ads that have been leaked so well, far. Well, I mean, it's an interesting thing. I mean, it's, you know, if I was running marketing of a big car company right now, what I would do is I would tell my agencies to crank up a long form uh, video slash ads for the Super Bowl but not actually do a buy on the Super Bowl because what's happened this week, it's amazing to me, but the car manufacturers just can't keep it in their pants long enough. You know, they just can't help themselves. They're showing all they're, their ads. They're showing all their ads and they're saying, oh yeah, but we're buying a lot of social interaction. It's going viral. It's great. Then why watch it on the game? Because I can assure you that a lot of people, when they see a car ad, my point in my column was, if I'm in charge of marketing, of, of, I would choose not to be on the Super Bowl because I think 99 out of 100 car ads, yes, there are exceptions, uh, are a waste of money on the Super Bowl. So now, now this week, the last two weeks, they've been, all the car companies have been showing their ads on, on YouTube. I mean, they just can't even, they can't okay. help them. I want, to give a, I want to give an opposing opinion. And I don't, I don't know how foolish I am to take on the great Peter DiLorenzo yeah. in the ad space, because I am a PR guy. But, but I will try. I don't disagree with the premise. However, I would say they're no longer ads. They are marketing platforms. It's, it's, to me, it's become no different than buying a sponsorship, buying, a, buying a, a, some sort of an engagement. You're, you're basically, you're buying something to, to peg all your communication to, and you're putting social and earned media and all these engagement activities. I, you know, I, yeah, I, I get that, but then why spend $3 million? Because why spend $3 million on, uh, you know, a race, or $3 million I mean, dollars I on mean, a... You could, you could come out with your ads in the, the mass of all the car companies showing their Super Bowl ads, and people would say, oh, wow, this is great. Uh, hey, if, you could, if the NFL would let you get away, with, you, with don't call them, you don't call I, them I think Super Bowl. But here, here, here's play. the difference is that you don't have to say, yeah, who, who can stop you from saying I got a Super Bowl ad? Ne next Monday, if there's a car ad that's really good that hasn't been pre leaked, that's what everyone's going to be talking about. That's right. what everyone's yeah, going to be talking about. Peter, look, I was on today on YouTube. We were on YouTube today, and the, uh, the Jerry Seinfeld Acura ad is up to 7 million views. That's a lot of eyeballs. And I mean, it's all over the place. I've got auto in my Facebook profile. I had everybody's ads pumped into my Facebook page on the paid side of the right, uh, on the right column. So I, 
It's cool, but it, what I'm saying is you could circumvent all of this and you could have just as big of a splash. I, and, I don't disagree, but can you tell me this? Can you say I have a, can you use Super Bowl, you don't the have term to. Super Bowl, are you infringing on NFL no, property you don't if have, you aren't paying no, for yeah, it? Yeah, no, you, I wouldn't say Super Bowl. You just do it in the vortex. Of yeah, the whole I would mess. do it in the here's vortex. Here's our new ad. Look, here's, yeah, here's our right. new ads, and everyone's right, like, "Wow, did, did I you that, see that Beltfire Eight commercial?" No, that no. Every really car company cool. ad guy just said, "That's brilliant." <laughs> <laughs> Jim Farley's probably pounding to say, "Why did you do that, Peter?" No, I, I, I think yeah, I get the whole the platform, the, the the platform. It's always about the platform, but you know, I would circumvent it. I wouldn't call them Super Bowl ads, but okay. Here's an example. Audi's going to have this spot called Vampires on this on the game, which truly sucks. A couple weeks ago, they released... I, I by the way, agree. <laughs> I mean, a couple weeks ago, they released a commercial early on, you know, YouTube about, uh, uh, called Ahab, oh. and it was this guy who's a tow truck driver in some, you know, like, it had Fargo music in it, but he sounded kind of like Robert Shaw and Jaws when he's talking to, you don't know what these things are getting. And, he's, <laughs> and this guy's talking to the audience. He says, yeah, you know, and he's, the only thing missing was he wasn't smoking, you know. And he's talking about the one that always gets away. Well, what always gets away is a quattro. It's brilliant. And it's a, the 60 is brilliant. And then they show up on the game with this vampire thing, and it's just like, oh, my God, what are you guys doing? So here's that Ahab spot that which I'm sure generated a lot of great vibe and goodwill towards Audi. And, and then this, this vampire spot's going to show up in the game, and it's so stupid and silly and beneath Audi. I, I just don't get it. Well, you know, remember when we had Jim Hall in here after the Detroit Auto Show and what we were talking all about, what we liked and everything. And one of our conclusions was, wouldn't it be really cool to go to an auto show where you didn't know what anybody was going to show? Yeah, you know what? God, it would be great. All right, so let me just, let's, let's take that one on. So we, we have that same call every year within the PR ranks. Oh, we have no surprises left. You guys leak everything. It's all out there. There's no surprise. And then you look at the metrics. And everything's about the throughput and the metrics. And I've looked at this every year, and it's the same debate that's gone on at Chrysler when I was there, at the GM when I was there, and at Ford, I've seen it here. Do you win by going long ahead and pumping out and, and, and backgrounding it to death and leaking it and teasing it and then revealing it? Or is it better to wait for the big surprise? And we ran the experiment at GM two years ago, three years, no, geez, I'm really aging, four years ago on the uh, CTS coupe. Mm -hmm concept that was going to be the big secret and it was a i think it won best in show or, or most significant i don't know it won award best People, production concept, everybody though. drooled and then we looked at the metrics it absolutely got decimated by about it, it finished like ninth out of of the top 10 in terms of the aggregate coverage and share of voice that you got because everybody was out there before and all the journalists have to write 50 stories in, in two days, so they write them all beforehand when they get it all leaked to them, and they don't have time to write it when they're in the show. Now, I'm sure if we kind of kept tracking it going forward, we probably recover. Well, that. that's what I would maintain, too. Plus, I would say that uh, GM doesn't do a very good job of unveiling oh, they're cars terrible. at they're an terrible. auto terrible. Everything show. at GM's terrible. And, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> well, hey, I'm the one saying it. I'm not getting you to say that, it. That Chevy it, reveal at, at the and, Detroit was and, just And terrible. conversely, I thought Ford did that fusion reveal was the best of the show, and it was really impressive. But hey, let's get to, to rapid fire. Let's see what what the viewers want to hear. Ben, let's launch it. Okay, Dr. Botox wants to know: Is it possible to shut German auto plants? Yes, if you basically, the, the, uh, it can be done. It has to be done with agreement of the, of the labor bench, but it essentially equates to massive uh, compensation for uh, individuals, and you still carry the full pension liability under law. So it goes something, I think it's like two to $300,000 a head, and you still carry the pension liability for them under the law. So. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's a big ticket. It's, uh, it's, it's very difficult. Ray Schaffer says, what insider information do you have on the next Viper? We're looking forward to seeing this in the very competitive sports car marketplace. Uh, there is going to be some uh, 
Maserati spillover between the two, allegedly. Between the Maserati mm -hmm. coupe. And, uh, and the Viper, but I would guess from a tooling standpoint, the base, the, bear, the, the bones of the car are pretty much going to be the same is what I would imagine. Hmm. You know, some styling difference. I know Ralph Jill has hinted at, you know, things, and he says it's going to knock our socks off. And it's not going to be a V10, it's going to be a V8. Is that right? Okay. Well, we'll see, but uh -huh. if I were doing the car, it would be a V8. I don't care what the purists say, because they've got the V8 to put in it. So. They do. They do. There's and it, no point doing a V10 if under Sergio's view of how the world works. And uh, New York Auto Show, isn't I, somehow I think that we're going to see it at the New York Auto Show. They're going to surprise concept unveil there? Uh, they they, or they leaked a Pebble silhouette Beach. teaser photo, yeah. which means that they're getting very close to showing the car. So I'm guessing New York, yeah, New York Auto Show. Uh, Let's see, DC Auto Geek says, the recent draft highway bill requires the DOT to submit a re uh, report to Congress on vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. Ooh, I know this space. Could this be the beginning of to the grid and how fearful is Peter? I'll be dead by then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know, you know. Yeah, they are gonna have these vehicles that, uh, aren't you, weren't you involved I, in? I was the former president of OnStar, so yes, we had the V2V programs. I, so, yeah, I'm wowed by V2V. I think it's an awesome technology. So how long, what, three, four years? I think V2V will evolve. The, the difficulty of V2V uh, imp being implemented um, isn't that you couldn't come up with some cursory level um, awareness between the cars. I mean, if you, you need transponders or GPS, uh, and some sort of a way to, to convey information for us, it would probably be cellular. The difficulty in it all is that uh, it takes about 15 plus years to turn over the fleet in aggregate uh, in this country. It's, it's probably longer now. Longer. It's, like, it's longer now. It's, 20 years. it's like 20 years now to turn the fleet, and then even then you have other cars. You, you, to be effective and to get the management, you would need everybody to be equipped. So you could force transponders onto older cars. That's 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 the ideal world. Yeah. I, you know, I, I've seen studies that show once you even start to get to 10 percent, you can start seeing the difference you, happen. You can, and I think in terms of timing, lights, monitoring traffic flows, because you have probes in the in the yeah yeah yeah. But that, that's the the, the full boat. What I'm talking about is GPS and Wi-Fi. So right. a car knows where it is, yeah. GPS and Wi-Fi. It tells everybody else where it is. Right. And but again, it is so that they can't crash into each yeah, other. Yeah, but if you only have 10 percent or you only have you always have again. And here's the other issue with that is that then you get into big behavior modifications. So how many of us who drive daily with rear backup detection on their car and then they go to the airport and get their rental car that doesn't have it and the brain's waiting for the beeps as you're just kind of whipping backwards uh, looking at the Blackberry or whatever and all of a sudden yeah. you know you've hit the car behind yeah. because you you were trained to well, I never beep. rent a car so I never ra run no, it point most people it, don't is so. it is you get that behavior modification and then you don't have it as an issue I think it's going to come I just don't I, I think we're talking Jetsons era stuff and I think the implementation the infrastructure uh, global codes and standards how are you going to manage this against global platforms it's huge. Memo to DC Auto Geek. I don't think I have to worry about it very <laughs> It's a big deal. Look, we can't even agree in this industry on basic protocols around, you know, Bluetooth alone, everybody thinks, is some common standard. The Bluetooth profiles change basically monthly. I mean, it, it, you've you seen the problem with all the in-car connectivity issues we have now. I just, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's those are minor teething problems. I don't think it's that big of an issue. <laughs> yeah, it's right. I, I think as, as people who are driving around in cars that aren't working right with their minor teething problems, you know, as far as uh, devices go, I think it's a big deal. I think I, it's a long way. I, I, I don't think it's that far off. I, I think we'll start to see standards put in place within two years. Government standards. They might be looking at, yeah, it'll be interesting. And you can retrofit everything into your in rear years. view mirror. So you could put it on cars, older cars. Two years, let's see. It's mandated. You have to mandate it to make it work. Okay. Uh, Jeff W. says, the Buick Regal GS is a great car, but does it really fit where GM seems to be going with the Buick brand? Besides, don't you think it will likely mainly compete for buyers with the new Cadillac ATS? Well, Good question. I, you know, I happen to like the, the Regal GS Turbo, sure. and it's cool, but it doesn't fit with where Buick's going. I mean, what, what are they doing? I agree. Yeah. To me, it would have been a great little Pontiac. Mm-hmm. Uh, but where is Buick going? I mean, does it fit with the... It's going wherever Opel goes. 
Yeah, well, Opal's not going anywhere, so I, I'm concerned. As a standalone car, I like the Buick Regal. Does it fit with where Buick's going? I don't think so. I'll tell you, the other thing on that one is that little dirty secret. If you look at average transaction prices, you look at a, a loaded uh, Regal GS like that, and then you look at the lower end of the CTS line, and you find out those guys are transacting almost on top of each other. You look at an SR Rex, which, again, is a five-passenger versus the Enclave, which is a six pa a seven-passenger. The Enclave is transacting higher on average than the and, SRX. And here's the deal, which I've touched upon before. You know, GM jettisoned four divisions, and they have four now. I still think they are stepping on each other. They're starting to step on each other in market because each of these brands thinks, well, yeah, we need a Regal GS Turbo, or, or we need a, you know, there's just, they're stepping on each other again. So maybe GM needs to turn into Chevrolet and Cadillac. Well, I, I think it's even more basic than that. They're going, oh, you know, we need to attract more uh, younger males. So we'll do a performance version of the car. Well, is the brand really about I know they were off 23% this month. Uh, with Buick down on sales. To me, the yeah. Buick, Buick is Escalade, uh, not Escalade, Enclave, yeah. uh, LaCrosse, nicely tailored, as Bill Mitchell used to say, really premium cars. I don't need, as much as I love the Regal GS Turbo, to me it was a giant. So you don't display. buy the hearkening back to GNX and all the Turbo not 6 at all. heritage and not all that at stuff? All. Remember the GNX is to enthusiasts, it's the holy grail, but that was a slim yeah, window. I, I still think here. the GNX was the wrong car for them to do. I think the T-types were the wrong car. Yeah. I, and, and they were the best things coming out of GM at the time, yep. but for that brand, no, it no. shouldn't have gone that To way. me, it's the Enclave, it's a beautiful lacrosse, and where is the drop-dead Riviera? Yes. That's what Buick needs to be. And bring back Pontiac and call the Regal GS Turbo a Grand Am. Okay, which car will lead the front-wheel drive near luxury race? Acura TL, Lincoln MX, Toyota Avalon, Hyundai Azera, Lexus ES350. Well, if you put in that segment, it'll be the MKZ all day, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, well, I have to hardly agree. <laughs> <laughs> you don't care, no. <laughs> you guys are, uh, okay, we'll skip that. Mitch W. wants to know, Peter, if you created and ran the perfect ad for the <clears throat> Super Bowl, ran it at the best moment possible, and nobody was in the kitchen at the time, what would it be worth the next day to your client car company? Ooh. Uh, ego satisfaction and backslapping, <laughs> incalculable. Uh, <laughs> Priceless. <laughs> Priceless. But actual sales, you know, that, that'll play out over the next 90 days. I don't know. I don't think you could put a number on it. But, boy, the backslapping would be good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for Chris Pruse, where do you see in car digital tech getting to in five to ten years? Will today's offerings be cruft by then? Uh, as big a lexicon as I have, cruft is not a word I've come cruft. Well, let, let's uh, uh, substitute the word shit for cruft. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Will today's offerings be cruft by that? You know, it's going to be, I believe, in-car connectivity is, gonna, is going to be dictated by devices being able to link to the cloud. I think the, 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 the problem is the long development cycles and the more integrated you make the technology in the car, the more you're tied to, to things changing uh, underneath you. So, mm -hmm. for instance, even on um, current vehicles that are coming out, there's uh, a lot of systems now that want to just mirror your phone. So you plug in in a low-cost car in Korea, you plug in your phone and you get the, the display just mirrors the phone and you can use the functionality. Just some simple protocols, you think. Um, we're trying to do that. Um, uh, actually, LG was trying to do that for us. And, you know, just within the car course of one year's development time, seven changes had to go or something like this into the system. And then you got to release the car. So I think more and more technology is going to be in the cloud. You'll have a big pipe to the car, uh, connectivity, probably multiple pipes, big screen, memory, uh, as much processor as you can get into the car. And you don't want to lock yourself into anything. I think the other big thing, and we talked about last time I was here, it's distracted driving. I, mm -hmm. I still believe uh, that's going to be an overriding, tempering issue to the deployment of technology. And I'll put the third one on the table, and I have deep conviction about this, and it's not just because I came from OnStar. People are overloaded with tech in the car. I mean, you basically get into some vehicles now, and you might as well be staring at the panel of a 757. And uh, my commercial for my perfect luxury car is going to be when you can walk in with your device, touch nothing, have only the only the information you want present to you uh, and programmed for you remotely by somebody else, and uh, and basically you you don't have to do anything. 
that would be a technological breakthrough, and I think that's where this will go. You will see the technology getting simpler, not more complex. Hmm. Interesting. Fascinating. Uh, DC Auto Geeks wants to know if I'm drinking an English stout. No, an ale. Uh, Jay Cujo says, uh, do you know if the Chevy Caprice PPV sales numbers are low because of demand, or is it due to the Aussie dollar being too strong? Well, the Caprice PPV, that's a, that's a police car. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're, you're tied to police sales. I, I would say it's too early to judge yeah, wait, how that car is going to sell in this market. I will say Aussie, Aussie dollar is a real challenge. There's no question. Currency is a big drag. God, when I was in Australia, this goes back a decade ago, it was 50 cents on yeah. the dollar. And now it's what? It's par? It's par. Yeah. So, and, oh, he also goes on to say, shouldn't they just build it in Oshawa already? <laughs> <laughs> well, the Canadian dollar's not a help either, That's it, it, <laughs> oh, frankly. Right. Uh, Al uh, Jadzak says, hi, Chris. Thanks a bunch for getting me uh, those OnStar, OnStar trailer hitch covers. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I display it proudly and love having OnStar on my vehicle. Good luck with your feature and John and Peter. Keep the show going. I don't miss any of them, even if I'm out of town. All right, yeah. Al. Thanks for remembering. Uh, Amato says, you've talked about the average age of vehicles in the U.S. What's the average age of vehicles in Europe? You would know that. Yeah, it was it was also increasing, and I want to say the average age, and I don't quote me on it, but I think we were at about nine and a half years. Uh, that goes back a few that years goes back ago. A few I'll years bet you they're at, yeah. about the same as us, which is eleven yeah. years yeah. now, yeah. because with the big collapse of the last couple of years, Oops, uh, car sales, uh, you know, have plateaued, and people are holding on to them long. They are, and again, cars just run better longer. Um, Brian Young says, uh, Volkswagen's teaser ad, uh, the Star Wars-themed Super Bowl commercial, the bark side. What in the world was that, he asks. Last year's commercial felt original. This one feels like they were out of ideas. Your thoughts? Well, that the bark side was well, uh, a, a teaser. A teaser, and, and describe the ad a little bit in case well, people... Well, the bark understand. side is a bunch of dogs on, and sitting in white and they start barking you don't know what they're barking and then you start hearing it's the imperial march theme from star wars and it's silly and ridiculous and then this like whippet walks by with yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's cool but the actual ad they're going to have in the super bowl is about a dog who wants to chase the car but can't so he does all these weight loss things has to get in shape yeah and he gets in shape and of course it's a different dog and he's running after the the beetle at the end it, it doesn't have near the impact you know, of the, i pity i pity the volkswagen guys and the chrysler guys because you know you score the rare super bowl hit as a car company i mean we've always been the dregs of the super bowl ad race for decades yeah. and now they got to one up themselves people don't understand how, yeah that's very difficult well even chrysler is you know Dust, trying to dump, tamp yeah. down expectations yeah. saying look there's no way we yeah. can match that again and that's smart of them to do it because yeah. they're not going to match that again you, you can't no question uh, let's see. I think we got time for another one here. Ron Paris says, I'm going to be in the market for a new car in the next year or so, and I'm afraid I'm going to land on something that has stop-start technology. A useless and irritating feature being forced down consumers' throats because of increasing cafe standards. Please tell me these systems are defeatable. Haven't heard or read any auto journalist comment on this to date. I don't think they're defeatable, they're defeatable. and I they're think not. you're going to see them explode i'm not so sure and and for two reasons number one uh kia is delaying the intro of its stop start on the on the rio and uh i test drove the car and it's a, it's a great little car but when the engine starts had, get, we heard the shutter, shutter goes through the car problem. but guess what so does the seven series hybrid so does a lot of very no, expensive hybrids I, peter's right though when you you're you got a couple years here but when you get out post-14, the, 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 the curve just right. steepens. But, but here's and the other are, thing. You are, what I'm hearing is that automakers are having a hard time on the EPS drive cycle, even coming up with one mile per gallon up a benefit. Huge, and here's why. The start-stop came out of Europe. Start-stop was a CO2 reducer for traffic sitting. The federal test procedures for setting CAFE only contemplate a certain amount of idle time. And so you could be sitting for an hour saving gazillions of gallons. It will never show up in your rating on the label based on the federal test procedure and how they run the test. Right. So that is the problem. But that's, again, it's going back to regulations. 
you know, that's a very practical thing in the, in the overall scheme of things, but it's not showing up. There's not a lot of incentive for the automakers to go there. But I, Peter's right. The, the numbers of tricks in the bag begins to narrow. So, I, I completely so agree, it, it, but I'm just hard. saying I find it interesting that, uh, that Kia is delaying their intro. I've been complaining for the last couple of years on a number of the very high. Uh, the Prius does a great job of it. I'll tell you another car that has good stop-start is uh, Chevy Malibu Eco. They, yeah. they nailed that thing. It, it's a, pretty I've, good. I've driven a couple of Porsches, and it seems fine to yeah, me. Yeah, they'll be on the, if, on the other cars coming out of Ford here shortly. And, uh, yeah, it's it's. I think it's interesting. I don't think there's – it's almost like electric, so there's some skittishness about selling it, just like with the power shift transmissions. Mm -hmm. They just feel different, and people think something's up. Yep. but uh, And the reason that they will not be defeatable is because if you put a fuel economy device on a car, EPA wants to know it's always going That's to right. be used. Well, in this case, though, it is so embedded in the electronics of how the engine operates and calibrates, it mm -hmm. couldn't work without it. Right. Well, look, we're at the top of the hour. We should... Uh, oh, we got some phone calls? Let's bring it in. Okay. Hello, John and Peter. How's everybody doing and your guests, too? My question is, in episodes past, you've talked about how Fiat really relies on Chrysler to keep going. And my question is, and I'm a huge Chrysler fan, so there might be some bias in this question, but do you think that Fiat might turn uh, Chrysler down or make it down like Daimler did and, and took away from it and just leave it hanging? Um, I hope I asked that right. In other words, what Daimler did to Chrysler, do you think Fiat will? Thank you very much. Enjoy your show very much, and enjoy listening. Thank you. Bye-bye. And this is Scott, and I'm from the Villages, Florida. All right. All right, uh, from Florida. I, I think Fiat's beholden to Chrysler's success now. It's their only profitable Flat point out. right now, I think. You know. Yeah, Yeah. if anything, the opposite's going to happen. Yeah. Hey. You know. In, in fact, there's even rumors, I, I, I don't quite believe them, that Sergio Marchionne may even move the headquarters of the company to Detroit. I, I got to tell you, and I know Peter's got strong opinions about Marchionne, but having lived through this whole horror story for the last three years, I still think he's going to look like the smartest guy in the room when all's said and done because he's going to have scored the most for the least. And I am super impressed with the Chrysler lineup. Every time I see the redo of the 300, get into a Jeep Grand Cherokee, and see that new Dodge Dart, which I think is a great-looking car. I think they're going to do ex extremely well. And and I, I'm with you, Chris. I'm I'm pretty bullish on where they're going. Uh, I like the management at Chrysler. And what I like too is, in the past, Chrysler always did a good job of styling, but the cars weren't quite never, up to the design. Tom Gale did a brilliant job, but oh, no. you know we the rest it on, of it wasn't we did there. On cheap back in the day. And no I'm doubt. telling you now, uh, I'm super impressed by the way the 300 drives, the way the Grand yeah. Cherokee drives. I mean, uh, up and down the line, uh, these are real cars, and I'm very bullish on where Chrysler's going. I, and and the good stuff isn't even in the That's showrooms yet. I mean, yet. this is the stuff that was the Band-Aid stuff. Right. So. Oh, we got a few more questions that just came in quick. Uh, Sean wants to know, any word uh, on the Ford Falcon? Uh, I'm sure he's talking about Australia. Will it stay rear drive or go front drive or all-wheel drive? I haven't, I haven't I have heard. I have no knowledge. Okay. Uh, my bet is it stays rear That's drive. That's a big controversy, though. I know it's a big controversy. Yeah, big. But uh, I still think it's absolutely possible to meet cafe standards with rear drive in the mix. I'm not saying most the mix. Oh, you're right. I'm saying you're you can have rear with, drive. Well, you're going to do it with trucks. It's all based on footprint. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Uh, and Unsprung asks, has anyone has anyone seen any numbers on if Super Bowl ads bring in more sales? You guys ought to know that one. Uh, they can be positive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it can put a company on the map. My best example of that, GoDaddy.com was nowhere. I mean nowhere when that guy took a flyer in the Super Bowl. And now, he and he said in interviews, it's because of the Super Bowl ads, his company is now, I don't know if it's the, huge. the largest, but it's... It's, that's a dot com, you know, in a in a mega growth business. What about in, in, in cars? In cars, you know, I don't know. Did the Chrysler M and M ad do anything immediately for Chrysler sales? No. It made people around here feel good for five minutes, 
and uh, you know it kind of got Chrysler in the discussion. But was there people clamoring to knock down the showroom doors and buy cars after that ad? What's the great What's the great advertising question? I know half of all advertising is effective. I just don't know which. Yeah, yeah but I would I would take issue on the uh, the Chrysler 200. Sales were up 850 percent this month compared to a year ago. Well, yeah, but and a year ago is about keep, the time when the ad. You keep talking about that. Um, <laughs> Shitty little 200, but that's okay because it was a it was a bad car before. Now they they've glossed up the pig and never you're never gonna go broke in this con country uh, overestimating the taste of the American public. So if they like that, if that floats their boat, more power yeah, I, to them. But I'm not gonna assign greatness to that car. No, I'm not either. I'm just saying. And I don't attribute it to the ad either. I think it's just they put money on the hood. That's all they had to sell, and they fleets. could grind them out. They had fleets, and it's all good, and that's fine. Again, I will say, I think Chrysler's done a great job, but when I say that, it's the true believers who were at Chrysler in the trenches who did the great Grand Cherokee, who, who did the reskin of the 300, who did whatever they did. That's why they're successful right now. Sergio had his hand out. They gifted him the company without all the debt, without all the problems, and he just, uh, the financial problems, and he's just, you know, he's smart enough to not screw it up. So, if he's the executive of the year, that's fine. Well, not to me. Is <laughs> I, like uh, we said before, I, I think they're only just getting going. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, why don't we wrap it up at this point? This has been great having you here yeah, again, Chris. Me. I mean, it's, uh, it's really cool having you down here. Or Anytime. up here, or over here, or whichever oh, I'm way a it is. Guy. I know Northville guy, so I'm nearby. <laughs> oh yeah, very nearby. And Peter, good seeing you as good always. Good seeing you, John. And next week we'll really get into those Super Bowl ads. And, yeah. And parse all that. But uh, hey, we want to thank the, the volunteers in the chat room who helped us. Uh, want to thank our sponsors for making this show possible. Remember, you can friend us at Facebook.com/slash Autoline Detroit. Follow us at Twitter.com slash autoline, go to autoextremist.com, follow Peter at twitter.com slash autoextremist. And uh, I mentioned that we would talk about Roundabout later in the show, and this is that time. The guys are going to have Bob Hall, yes, the evil twin brother of Jim Hall, on tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. But thank all of you for having joined us. And good night, Simon, wherever you are. <laughs> Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. And by Chevrolet, Chevy runs deep. We don't have a winner, huh? Oh, I guess we don't. Um, ben said that they got one or the other of the questions right, right, but not both. Not both. We can do it again next week. Yeah. New question. No, same question. Well, if they can't get it after a week, I think you got to just you got to you got to pack it in. I got the first one right. Well, you know what? Uh, do without Google. You know, but the big audience is on the podcast, not not the people who watch live. So, you know, there's far. That's true. You get far bigger net. I guess you can keep it open, right? I mean, the sure. first right answer in email based on time should win it, right? Right. That's right. Maybe we'll do something in Autoline Daily tomorrow about it, too. Okay, sure. So, <clears throat> But you can come up with your own questions if you want. No, no, no. I, I mean, let's okay. make it not easy. Let's, okay. Let's make them think. Well, not think. Let's make them Google. browse. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a good one. Yeah. So I, I, we had, do you know Carl Ludvigson? He's a uh, God. He spent a uh, huge time of his career in PR. He's got to be close to eighty name. right yeah, now. Yeah, he's been around forever. But we had him on two weeks ago. That that was a lot of fun. Yeah, he uh, <clears throat> he was Bill Mitchell's personal PR oh, guy for, that's for right. almost yeah, three years. Yeah, yeah, my yeah. dad. He worked for um, my dad's staff. And I'm reading an interesting book now. Uh, I don't know if you guys heard about this, about some Jewish engineer in Germany who really came up with the, the a lot of the basics for the beetle and was really pushing this idea. And the Nazis were not going to have some Jewish guy get all the credit for this. So they literally hounded him out of Germany. And uh, 
it's not all that well written of a book. I'm about three quarters of the way through it right now. But it has a lot of fascinating information about the German auto industry in the 20s and 30s that I didn't really know a whole lot That's about. The other interesting thing about being in Germany at Opel and stuff, there's like this, because their heritage means so much to the German brands, and there is this whole kind of, yeah. you know, historic uh, removal of those days. Um, uh -huh. Very interesting. Hey guys, the chat room is asking if we can restate the question for the contest just one last time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I will. Two part question. First question What was the name I used when we launched Auto Extremist on June 1st, 1999? The, the pen name or pseudonym? Pen name, whatever. It was only on the site for, Nom de guerre. for three months. Second question. Who finished fourth overall at the Daytona 24 hour in 1971? There were three drivers, and what were they driving? That's it. And boy, does that Swatch watch look really cool. It is cool, actually, <laughs> for what it is. It's pretty cool. I mean, it is, you know, stopwatch. Was that, a, was that a, a Christmas oh gift that you didn't care to keep? Or no, actually, no. You should put a story behind it. No, it was, it's brand new. It's never obviously been... Out of the case. Out of the case. It was uh, sent to me for being a very special customer of something. I don't know what. <laughs> I somebody, I was some I think I could have given away swag for a question. Yeah, I would have brought something in. I, had, I mean, oh, I think some, some, no. somebody, uh, some banking institution or somebody. Any of your guests. Oh, Don't come with no, swag. no, that's a great idea. You know, you got to bring if you want to be on the show and get fame, you got to bring something. You got to bring something to give away. Oh, that's good stuff. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thanks, yeah, it's been great, Chris. Yeah, enjoy it. It's cathartic. Thank you.